So if you followed the channel for a few months, you may remember us playing a clip from Walking with Beasts, where a giant ground sloth scares away some Smilodon from a carcass and then scavenges on the meat that they killed. And I showed that clip because there was an earlier paper this year which showed Aromotherium, a particular genus of giant ground sloth, didn't do this. The isotopes in its teeth were much more in line with those of animals which are entirely herbivorous. But Aromotherium is only one genus of many different giant ground sloths. And New Method has suggested that at least one giant ground sloth did feed on meat, at least occasionally. So to start with, these authors thought that there were some issues with using teeth specifically in these kinds of studies. And that's because teeth in mammals only grow for a part of the animal's life. So you're going to get at least somewhat of a bias in that sampling. And so they actually used fur, which does grow throughout the animal's life. And they looked at fur from two different ground sloths. And rather than looking for the same isotopes that are in the teeth, they looked specifically for isotopes which are included within amino acids specifically glutamic acid or glutamate, which increases in concentration as an animal becomes more carnivorous. But they also looked for phenylalanine, which does the opposite. So the ratio of these two amino acids can really help researchers understand what an animal was doing trophically. Essentially, what were the main things that it was eating? But in addition to just looking at the fur for these amino acids in these ground sloths, they also looked at many modern zoo animals and a few wild omnivores in order to try and have a solid comparison for what the expected values would be in different kinds of animals. And so from that, they were able to compare those values to those of the sloths. And one of the sloths they tested, Mylodon darwinii, or Darwin's ground sloth, had amino acid concentrations, which were much more similar to those of the omnivorous species. But that's still not quite all the evidence, because an important feature for herbivores is having occlusion in their teeth. And our molars actually do the same thing, because it just means the teeth come together in a way that makes a grinding surface. And out of all of the ground sloths, Mylodon and its closest relatives were shown to have the least amount of occlusion. This means that they would have been the worst ground sloths at processing plant material. And so scavenging may have just been a necessary step in their survival, as in general, meat takes less energy and less effort to start digesting when compared to plant material. But this doesn't mean that the earlier paper which looked at Aramotherium is wrong. Like I said, this new paper looked at different species of ground sloth, and the second was Nothrotheriops shostanensis, which was shown to have a much more herbivorous ratio of these amino acids. So it may have just been one group of ground sloths that were closely related to Mylodon, which may have been omnivorous. Though how robust this new amino acid testing is will need to be tested more thoroughly with multiple studies. But it does seem promising so far, and it's not all a closed case on giant ground sloths, but at least some of them seem to have had a taste for meat when they could get it. And that then also means that the ground sloths would have had different ecologies from one another. So we can't just lump them all into one single group, they were a very diverse group of animals. Between some of them being among the largest herbivores on land at that time, some of them being pretty large and apparently omnivorous, potentially comparable to things like bears, and then also some of them becoming mostly aquatic. They were an incredibly diverse group that we normally don't think of as being that diverse. We kind of just look at giant ground sloths and go, ah, they're big normal sloths, when that's really not the case. 